So let me tell you about, about malaria a little bit. I, you know, in, in Uganda, malaria is very, is, is very perennial, is, is hyperendemic. 95% of the country uh, is endemic, is endemic for malaria. And most of it is pifarciparum. In other places, they have other species, but this is the species that we have here. These are our primary vectors. I'm not going to go into detail, but, but you can read them. We've been doing a lot of work to control the disease. You know, we started giving uh, artemisinin combination therapy in 2006, 2004, 2006. So it, we really have very powerful drugs to treat the disease. You know, we, we have a very strong program of intermittent preventive therapy during pregnancy. We do mass campaigns of, of nets. Uh, we did one this year, we did one in 2017, 18. We hope to do one next year. So we, we are we're really rolling out these um, uh, effective interventions. And we're also providing indoor residual spray uh, in 15 districts in Uganda. Uganda has about 100, 120, 130 districts. They keep changing every day. But, but <laughs> so many. So IRS is in some places in the region of Spain, but not in others. So I want uh, to show you like the kind of data we've had. For example, let me begin by this health facility-based surveillance, you know, under the Uganda Malaria Surveillance Project that we started, you know, to do in 2006. So for the last 13 years, we've been collecting data. And we've been collecting data in, you know, all over the country. Um, so this data is individual level. Uh, we use standardized logbooks and we enter it into an electronic database. We begin by training people at the health centers in diagnostics, uh, emphasizing testing of all patients. We currently have 35 sites. And then we collect all of these, patient demographics, patient address. Uh, I'm emphasizing patient address, meaning that we can actually trace where, if we get many cases of malaria, we can trace where they are coming from. And in fact, more recently, we want to use uh, uh, this parameter to estimate incidence from our prevalence data. So we are collecting data on fever, malaria tests, malaria test results, test positivity rates, pre prescription practices, of course, and many other data points, and many other variables. And we've had 3.5 million observations. So I am really emphasizing this so that you can know what's, what can be available, uh, findable, accessible, <laughs> something like that. So moving on, <laughs> moving on to, um, so when we collect this data, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of things we look at, uh, the kind of uh, um, analysis that we do. For example, here, this, I'm only showing you areas where indoor residual spray was started in 2014 and has been continuing. You can see very dramatic declines. I hope. I hope you can see them from where you are. Um, very powerful intervention. Um, so in short, you know, when we collect this data, we are able to monitor, you know, the impact of interventions. Um, when you roll out, you know, nets, you know, we see what impact they have using this health facility data. Or you know, using this longitudinal health facility data. So uh, let me continue. Now, let me tell you about PRISM. I think PRISM is what was given in, on the title of, 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 of the program you have. PRISM stands for Program on Resistance, uh, uh, Immunology, Surveillance, and Modeling. We just came up with this acronym. But these are international centers of excellence that are funded by the NIH. We were quite privileged to, to have one. Uh, there are right now 11 others, uh, so we are one of 11. Um, but you know, we had PRISM 1, 
which ended in 2017, and we were very lucky to be funded this next round. So we've started Prism 2. <laughs> but now, what I'm going to tell you about is Prism 1 that ended in 2017. So we did this, these studies, you know, like I'm going to describe in Kanungu, Southwestern, you know, you can see where Kanungu is, Dora in the east, and then Jinja, which is a relatively up in the area. So these are, I'm not going to go into all that we did. We did a lot of things. Uh, I've described, you know, the health facility-based surveillance, which is, it was partly funded by prison, but partly from other sources. And this one, we've been doing it for a long time. But we put it here because, you know, we took it as part of our of the entire program of prison. But let me start with cross-sectional surveys. So we did cross-sectional surveys in 2012, 2013, 2015, around, you know, those areas that I've mentioned um, in, in Kanungu, Jinja, and, and Toro. For cross-sectional surveys, we did 200 randomly selected houses in each site. And then, you know, the data we collected included, you know, malaria, parasite prevalence, coverage level of control interventions, and a lot of other data points, um, which I've not listed here. We also did cohort studies of kids between uh, half a year, six months, and 11 years uh, of age from 100 randomly selected houses. This was longitudinal. We were seeing kids every three months. Uh, later on, we were seeing them every month, and we were monitoring malaria episodes. So, so we do malaria smears every, every so often, every, every three months and, and every month later on in the study. And looking for both microscopic and submicroscopic parasitemia. We're also collecting data on housing structure and many, many other data that we are collecting on these, on these patients. We're also doing entomology surveys CDC light traps in the same houses as the cohort studies. Um, and we're collecting these once a month in each house. And the data we collected included number of mosquitoes, species identification, sporozoids, human biting rate. Again, this is really to show you like the range of things we, we, we were doing. Now, this is a snapshot of really what what kind of uh, results. Um, if I showed you all the papers that came out of that work, it, it would blow your minds away. But uh, suffice it to say, you know, we, for example, for the cohort study, where we enrolled this age of children, we had five, over 5,000 uh, treatments of malaria. And, you know, severe malaria was rare. We didn't get any deaths. Of course, when you get these children coming back to you and you treat them early, you prevent severe disease from happening. Um, um, so we really got very, very few cases of severe disease, which is very good, being that prompt treatment with SETs works. Now, we also, like I said, we did a submicroscopic um, parasitemia. As you can see, you know, this is microscopic. You know, when you do a blood smear, you can only detect this much. When you do PCR, you can see how much <laughs> you are able to detect. In other words, when you do a blood smear, you can't rule out that somebody doesn't have any parasites. In fact, the more you look, the more you find. I would be surprised if for the Ugandans, if I did ultra-sensitive PCR, maybe Many of you could be carrying a parasite or two in your blood. But, but anyway, this was just to show you that, you know, the more you look, the more you find uh, if you use sensitive. Now, we also did parasitic uh, resistance. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but let me maybe use one thing or two to illustrate. For example, if you look here, uh, where now? Let me use one. For example, for some of you who know, uh, resistance mutations to, to some of these uh, um, uh, resistance mutations. If you see here, 
And now, which one can I use? Let me, should I use this one? For example, here you can see between 2012 and 2015, do you see this, this mutation? This mutation confers very, very high level <coughs> resistance to antifelics, that 164L. Um, so anyway, when we do these things longitudinally, we are able to see like how these mutations vary over time. For example, this one of croquin, I don't know whether you can see it, of aminoquinones, the, the, the K7060. Do you see it coming down over time? Like, like if you look at 2012, the blue. Um, so the mutant, you can see it coming down. In other, this was this was published, you know, showing that actually we are regaining croquin sensitivity uh, when you look at these mutations, at least in the lab. I don't know if you gave it to somebody how they will respond, but uh, certainly in the lab, this this mutation is decreasing over time. Um, now let me give you, uh, I hope my time is not, yeah. We also do birth cohort studies and uh, we've generated a lot of data. We've done birth cohort one, birth cohort two. Again, these studies are funded by the NIH. The NIH funds a lot of what we do. Um, this is the years in which they happened. But I think let me just point to you that, for example, birth cohort one, we had 300 and over 3,000 static clinic visits. Bath cohort two, you can see them there. Bath cohort three, you can see over 16,000 visits. And again, collecting data on all of these, fever, malaria, parasitemia, malaria, parasitemia, placenta malaria, histology, birth weight, hemoglobin levels. So all of these data are, are really available. Now, we are collaborating, and I think Jessica will go a lot into this, um, with, with, into the Clean APDB project that is headed by, by David Roos and others, again funded uh, by different sources, NIH and Bill and Melinda Gates. So you will see like this snapshot. Of course, when you go into this, you know, into Clean APDB, you will find this. And these are our prism data, and they are available. Um, and uh, so the prism data from the cohort studies at the technology surveys are available, and they can be viewed. And here, these are the number of participants, and over 44,000 visits. And you can see all the variables here. Uh, you know, they are put in such a way that they are easily accessible, and you can easily generate um, uh, you know, your analysis from there. Um, uh, this is like looking at individual patients. Um, my time is, 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 is up. But individual patients, here you can see, uh, this thing is no longer working, but you can see the red field things. It's like a patient comes in, today is positive, the following month is negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, you know what I mean? The same, the same patient. So you can see the red field ones, uh, the positive, positive, uh, positive ones. Um, I think I'm just about to finish. You know what? I, I just wanted to introduce you, you know, to these data that have been, you know, like Jessica will show you, they've been put in this open access, this clean APTB uh, program that we are collaborating with. And you know, you people who are data minded, these data are publicly available. They are findable, accessible, <laughs> interoperable, interoperable, and and reusable. And very soon, also, they promote data that I showed you. Lots, lots of data. They will be in this format, which you know, which everybody ca can use. And that is the way uh, the world is going. Um, you know, making data accessible to everyone so that it can benefit, you know, public health. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Okay, and so we, I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're trying to do around um, bioinformatics capacity development um, in Uganda. And after myself, I will come and say, um, something along similar lines for, for Mali, and then we'll switch over to, um, 
to Sichua and, and Jessica, who are giving related topics. So, anyway, we are um, trying to, to take a multi-pronged approach in Uganda. Um, as you may know, there are several things that it takes to build good training programs and good capacity um, around not just mathematics, but around a lot of other things. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to look at very carefully is our scientific choices um, in terms of where our trainings are, are oriented. And we're paying a lot of attention to uh, the curriculum, therefore, that fit into those choices. And as you know, um, when you get good fellows, good students, good researchers, um, that is usually like 50% of the work done. So um, recruiting the best people that we can find is important. And we're giving all that uh, the right administrative and IT support that, that is required. And as is evident from what we can see in the room, collaboration is a very important part of the work that we're trying to do to build those skills and infrastructure. Um, so the scientific focus in Uganda is mostly around two themes. The first is human genomics and genetics and how that interacts with non-communicable diseases. But then we are also in the second theme paying attention to pathogen genomics, but especially how it interacts with, uh, with the human genome. And of course, the most important it, um, diseases, infectious diseases in our ecosystem. Um, so in terms of building this capacity we have, long-term um, degree programs that are starting this fall, as most, you are, most of you are probably aware, a master's and a PhD program in bioinformatics. And we will also have some postdoc uh, positions, as well as short trainings, one of which is actually happening in June by, uh, by it's called the Survival Genomics Short Course by uh, Hingston, Cambridge. And that's going to happen and we we intend to have so many such short courses for people that have needs of that nature um, in terms of training our master's cohort that is going to start um, in the fall um, in august is a fairly diverse cohort um, in terms of who is supporting which uh, students and again that underlies the idea of, of, of collaborations. So this, the grant has its own uh, students who you can see at, at the top, but then other institutions and organizations in our ecosystem like IDI are actually going to be supporting some students. And we hope to have a total of about 19 to 20 master students. And um, some of them have already received some preliminary training um, in, in bioinformatics. These are some of the faculty that are, that are, that are going to be engaged in the master's program especially. Um, some of them are at the same time PhD students. Uh, it, it's, it's still, of course, our faculty is still limited because bioinformatics is a fairly new program in our ecosystem. Um, but we hope with the 20 students, master's students we're starting with, uh, this cohort of people will be fairly helpful. Um, and they have backgrounds in biology, in computing, and in, math, in mathematics. Um, some of the faculty, of course, we hope to use uh, adjunct, as you will see later on. Um, like we said, it's important to have the right structures around these training programs. And this is the administrative team that is kind of uh, going to be running most of the administrative work. And indeed has already been doing that for the last um, for the last almost two years. Um, so that is Harriet on top, and then Professor, sorry, Dr. Um, Chibunike on the bottom left, and uh, Shirley. And, you know, we, we try to make sure that they get the training that they need <coughs> to be able to provide the right administrative support. Um, so Harriet has been to an NIH training for, uh, for grant administrators that happened in Bordeaux, France. And uh, <coughs> Chibunike and, and Shari will be attending. We actually went to a, to a seminar in 2018, in, I think it was in San Francisco, telling from the bridge. Um, 
And so we're really paying a lot of attention to not just the bioinformatics, but also the support that goes around it. Um, so in terms of the curriculum, we were lucky that um, Professor Nicole Mulder, the first author on that paper, yes, Professor Nicola, the first author on that paper, um, uh, around HP Bionet, um, and this entire group that you can see, they've done some work about what the important bioinformatics competences in, in, uh, in, in Africa are. And we relied on a lot of that information to constitute our curriculum content. Um, as you can see, they're not just general biological themes, but they're also computational themes. And then there are things around communication, uh, professional ethical and legal issues, um, professional ethical and legal issues, all of which uh, we are very intent around um, making our graduates um, complete. Uh, you, I think you saw one of the questions that he asked Professor Kamia just now was, you know, um, the, the privacy of, of patients. Because we work with data, that becomes a very important um, underlying thing. And so, you know, you don't have to look in detail here, but these are really the core, um, both the cores and the electives that these students will be doing, and they capture um, the core competencies as determined in the research paper I just showed you. Um, there are a few that may not be here, but this is where um, the course is really going to be rotating. Um, <clears throat> so, we're very lucky that even though we've started with a very limited number of skills in, in our ecosystem, I think we're really building up momentum to, uh, to, to a very powerful positions. All these people are in the pipeline at different stages of the PhD pipeline. Um, so Marion, is a, she's, a, she's a PhD student. She just finished her master's in immunology and done some preliminary training in bioinformatics. So she's a new program, she's a new PhD on our bioinformatics program. And it's a sandwich program, as I'm going to explain later on. She's right now at Baylor in Texas. She went to start there and then she'll finish here. Um, so is um, Mokisa. I forgot the name, but John Mukisa, didn't put his name here, but uh, he's, he's also started, he's in Baylor right now. Um, Alfred Sekajiri is uh, just finished a master's in bioinformatics at Glasgow um, one and a half years ago, and he's going to be uh, both helping with a master's program teaching, but also a PhD student here in Macquarie, and he'll spend some time at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, which is where I went. Um, I see Jessica there is smiling. That's in her neighborhood. Um, and of course, these two are also at UGA, so Jessica, you can have a wider smile. Um, uh, Ronald and Samuel Chimonda, they are currently in their third year, so we're hoping to have them within the next two years, to have them back here. Um, um, Ronald is, is focusing on epidemiology, and, uh, and Samuel is focusing on bioinformatics. Now, those are all PhD students in mathematics, but as a lot of talks, and indeed as this entire conference has illustrated, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, are also becoming very important themes within bioinformatics because of the value that they can provide. And so, uh, Rose, she's, uh, she's my PhD student, um, and she gave a talk here yesterday. She's a PhD in computer science, and she's doing a lot of AI work. And uh, so we are, and we're working very closely with the AI lab. Um, Mutebesa was here, Daniel, and other people. Uh, and Joyce, she gave a talk here yesterday. Um, and of course, I, the aim is really to build a complete ecosystem that can leverage um, all the technologies around, but also address all the needs from all angles and all directions. Um, so. These are some of the collaborations we have in terms of uh, teaching and research in, in the US. So I just showed you um, these two here at the bottom. They are right now in uh, Chris's lab um, um, at UGA. And then these two on the top left are, oops. Yes, uh, right now in, uh, at Baylor with, uh, with Graham. He was here um, about two, three weeks ago and we went through about what needs to be done and all that. And of course, um, 
uh, Alfred will be going to uh, to Georgia Tech to do work with King, who I think actually, Jessica, he was your student, right? No, same program. Same program. Okay. Uh, he was my professor uh, when I did my PhD. So, um, so. So these are the teaching collaborations, and the idea is that students spend some time there because there's a lot of value in, in spending some time in a mature ecosystem and learning how things work, and then, but then there's also value in, in, in studying in your local and home environment because that's where you're going to practice. So, and that is why we were very purposeful about designing these programs as sandwiches where students spend some time there and also spend some time here. Um, and of course, what you get with, from such experience is includes not just the technical ability, but even the social um, wherewithal of how to, uh, to interact with collaborators and that kind of thing. Um, so again, along the theme of collaboration as a tool in capacity development, we are obviously uh, have been very lucky and blessed to have this group here. Um, led by Darrow, who is in the room. Um, they've been super helpful with uh, helping us develop our content, one, but then also uh, actually doing some training for some of our trainers, or the so-called trainer trainers. Um, it's, it's a group that we hope to continue interacting with as we find our ropes and find our feet on this complicated journey. Um, uh, I think here they had hosted me over to take me through some of the things that we needed to do. Um, and in fact, this is uh, a training that they gave us um, in August last year. So, it's, um, and that time, uh, Mariam, who is also in the room, came with a different team. This time, she came with another team. So we're having uh, we're being exposed to all sorts of teams, which is really good. Um, and again, that's along the theme of collaboration. So in terms of the infrastructure, um, we, uh, the program is going to be hosted, at least physically, at the Infectious Diseases Institute. I had a picture here, which is not showing up. Um, uh, at the Infectious Diseases Institute, again, as part of the collaboration between Macquarie University. And it has those different facilities, which have, you've seen several pictures of those over the last um, um, couple of days. And these are some of the people we're working with. Again, it has lost the pictures that I have for the local IT team. Um, and then we also have, the local IT team is also getting support from, uh, from our international uh, partners. Um, Chris is in the room, and I think Brian is in Macquarie right now. Um, and of course, as, as you know, this, this, this equipment is not just about installing it but it also requires maintenance, and so uh, IT support becomes critical, almost as important as the mathematics itself. Uh, this picture has already been shown. These are our spunky new uh, facilities with all the bells and whistles. Um, if you haven't been, you should show up tomorrow. Um, you know, you enter the room and you're quite confused as to whether you are in Uganda or you are somewhere in the NIH. So, uh, this is actually where the classes are going to be happening in bioinformatics and the analysis and that kind of thing. Um, this is the VR room. This was this is the one at the NIH in uh, in 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 in, Berlin, in Washington. But uh, these are the same people, so they are also providing us a lot of support. Uh, you probably have not seen them very much, but uh, Phil gave a talk here yesterday afternoon. Megan has been working away at Macquarie right now. She's setting up for tomorrow. Um, and you know, these are the new competences that are coming on board for us um, around visualization and its importance as, as a tool in pedagogy. Um, so of course, that has to be enabled by connectivity because it includes a, a crosstalk between different locations, but also within the same location and data transfer and transmission. Our connectivity becomes an important part. And uh, thanks to Chris, who is in the room, um, he's been able to figure out how to make this work for us. And so we're getting a lot of capabilities in terms of connectivity from Ren. Um, and so uh, really, 
uh, being able to make S Uganda work, which is what we're going to launch tomorrow. Uh, clearly, everybody knows it takes the effort and attention of so many different entities, so many different individuals, and uh, this is this has definitely been the case here. Um, and so, thank you very much. That was a quick overview. Of My name is Awa Kulivali from Mali. Uh, I'm a bioinformatics consultant for the African Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics in Mali. I work for the Research Data and Communication Technologies at, in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and uh, Computational Biology at NIDE. Today I will uh, give you an overview of the ACE Mali activities. Um, there, there are a lot of research in opportunities in Africa, especially in infectious diseases. And uh, high throughput sequencing and other omics approaches have revolutionized biomedical research. However, uh, African researchers has, have not been taking advantage of these opportunities due to a uh, lack of access for training, bioinformatics tools, and uh, infrastructure, and long-term uh, support. So uh, to address this problem, the African Center of Excellence in Bioinformatics was built to uh, provide the training, uh, the infrastructure, and the long-term support. Uh, the vision of the ACE program is to uh, build sustainable capacity for bioinformatics in sub-Saharan Africa to support biomedical research for infectious diseases through uh, regional centers. Uh, the ACE program feature are in threefold. The first is the education. The education. The second is the postgraduate training, which uh, will help run the, the service standards. And all this is provided by the infrastructure. It all begins uh, with the public, public-private partners, which uh, we hope uh, will turn into self-sustaining. And uh, the regional centers are structured as follows. We have uh, the director of the center, the A staff, uh, plus the university uh, for governance. And all these are operated by global operations and uh, higher council of people that are, who are like best uh, web position to advise on bioinformatics. Uh, the, F, the first ACE program was um, built in Mali in 2015. So uh, we, uh, this was the first, uh, the pilot program, and was uh, to provide, um, trying to, pro, uh, to prove that the public and, oops, sorry, public and private partnership will work to build infrastructure uh, to train the trainer, to establish the education, to operate the infrastructure, and to um, see then see what happened. And uh, the center supports researchers, uh, provide training, uh, provide high performance computing. It's been optimized for regional needs. It leverages existing infrastructure. These are some of the uh, pictures from the opening ceremony. I'm just gonna... <laughs> and these are the funding partners of the ACE Mali. So uh, the center provide a low cost and low maintenance, high performance uh, computing system. Uh, the system includes all the required hardware and storage, and it's accessible on site using the FIN client at the telelearning center, or you can access it remotely. Uh, the system has a lot of bioinformatics software tools uh, to do bioinformatics analysis. The center also provides a telelearning center, which has been optimized for um, energy, audio, visual, and network. Uh, it has uh, 15 workstations 
And this telelearning center also facilitates both on-site and uh, distance learning. So uh, when the uh, ACE started, uh, the University of Science and Techniques and Technology of Bamako also uh, started a master program in bioinformatics. So the training uh, conducted by lo both, uh, local instructors and experts from collaborating institutions, uh, the NIA staff provides weekly supplemental remote seminars. And the, the program is uh, divided in four uh, semesters. And the fourth semester is dedicated to uh, a research project on topics suggested by students. The program curriculum was developed in coordination with the H3 Africa. What happened next? So uh, these are some of the outcomes. The first cohort, we enrolled eight students and all of them have graduated. And uh, some of them got uh, funding to continue with the postgraduate work. And some of them got uh, employed by PIs as research assistants. And uh, I've highlighted a couple, uh, Asitu Jara, who was, um, his, uh, who's continuing her PhD in bioinformatics under the Delgium Fellowship, and Kangai Jalo, also is uh, pursuing his PhD uh, studies under the scholarship of uh, US, USA, and Abraham, who also uh, got a job at the United Nations in Mopti in the northern part of Mali. Okay. Uh, the second cohort, we enrolled 13 students. Four of them have already defended, and the rest are still working on their projects. Uh, we have one international student from Gabon, and a couple of students that were sponsored by the Belgium program. And I've highlighted two students here who have been uh, awarded an internship at Tulane University, Abdullah Jawara, who's, uh, who's here, and Josie Togo are both uh, getting ready to go to uh, Tulane University to continue their work. Uh, the third cohort, we enrolled 11 students and uh, two international students, one from Burundi and another one from Nigeria. They are in their second semester now. More outcomes. Uh, the center with the partnership with uh, uh, Tulane University and H3 Africa Consortium have been organizing uh, bioinformatics training workshops since 2017. Uh, this year, which is still ongoing, uh, ending in two days, we had 15 participants from the university and the other Malian institution, and also from other countries, uh, Nigeria, Burundi, and uh, Burkina Faso. And this picture was taken during the second uh, workshop, the R workshop. And this is from the recent one. This is uh, Dr. Schaffer uh, giving the GIS course. More outcomes. So the with the existence of the center, researchers were able to um, write grants and then get fundings. And also in 2017, the founder partner were awarded with the NIH Director Award. And what did you learn from this? Uh, we, learn, we think that the student, student is the stakeholder. Uh, we think that it's more, it's more important to do more hands-on training uh, practicals and also have a local technical resource, which is me. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're very uh, important now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also train the trainer because we always have new things coming out and that's why we're doing the, we do the workshops. We've been collaborating with uh, PIs from different departments uh, on campus. So the Belgium project, project with the Professor Jim Lee. The, the center has been providing uh, 
logistic support, uh, consultation and training for the system administration, and also training for the student because we have uh, quite a few uh, Belgium students in the master program. This is the telelearning tele center of uh, the Belgium program. And uh, uh, these pictures were taken during the IBT course, the Introduction to Bioinformatics online courses, which is uh, part of the H3 Bionets. And I was a facilitator on, during this course. Uh, it lasted about four months. And we've been also working with uh, Dr. Gida Landry at the Neurogenetic Disease Department. So uh, Dr. Gida has about uh, five terabytes of genomic data stored in our, on our server, and we're expecting to get more from him. And also we've been uh, uh, providing bioinformatics cons consultation for his student here uh, to help him better analyze his uh, data. And our new uh, collaboration is with uh, Professor Jakite at the Department of Immunogenetics and Parasitology. So I've been assisting him with some of uh, the, his um, barcoding, DNA barcoding data. And uh, he's uh, been generating full sequencing data and will need uh, space for storage and bioinformatics expertise to analyze his uh, whole genome sequencing data. So in summary, the ACE program has demonstrated the value and utility of public and private partnership to build sustainable scientific capacity and has also produced well-trained graduates who are able to uh, pursue postgraduate training and also work in their field. It has generated new stream of funding for researchers and their institution, and personally for me, has uh, afforded me a job opportunity and enabled me to return to my own country. And also, I was able to, I'm pursuing right now my PhD um, uh, program under the funding of uh, Delgium. What I'm going to touch on is the Bioinformatic Research Program, which is an NIID funded program that's been around for over 15 years which is primarily a knowledge base that supports integrated data, metadata, and analysis tools to support um, infectious disease research. The key capabilities of the um, resources itself are to provide integrated data and metadata, to be able to access and query them, tools to um, analyze and visualize them, workspaces where users can conduct analysis, and provide hands-on training for all of these data and tool capabilities uh, in addition to specialized services for those who need additional help. And last but not the least, provide uh, just-in-time support and respond to new and emerging pandemic threats from a data um, analysis and management perspective. The, there are four different centers, and at this point they are organized by organism groups or pathogen groups. And as you can see, um, we spread across universities in the United States. University of Notre Dame focuses on uh, the invertebrate vectors of human pathogens. University of Pennsylvania with David Rose and Jessica, who's here representing the other center that focuses on eukaryotic and fungal pathogens. Northrop Grumman and JCBI together support viruses with a particular focus on in influenza. And last but not the least, University of Chicago provides uh, bacterial pathogen resources with a focus on antimicrobial resistance. What their primary role is to enable greater collaboration by integrating data across NIAID programs that uh, provide uh, an abundance of resources. And they started off with focus on genomic resources towards addressing key questions in microbiology and infectious diseases with the aim of identifying targets and new strategies for vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. So spend a minute or two on each of these centers. Vector-based, um, and all of these are searchable on Google and completely open access. And so what I've just thrown over here is a fact sheet about each of these um, centers. You don't have to quite read them, but 
Um, primarily, they provide access to data, a variety of tools, and ability to um, mine them based on use cases and specific questions um, pertaining from, coming from research groups. So this is um, vector-based that focuses on and has, provides about 35 different organisms, has a special focus on population and insecticide resistance data and surveillance data as well, and, and tools associated in mining and viewing these data sets. The eukaryotic pathogen, I won't say much about it because Jessica's gonna walk us through, and I think many of you are very familiar with this, but again, they provide uh, uh, extraordinarily unique resource for protozoan and fungal pathogens with a focus on genomic and phylogenomic data sets and very sophisticated search and query tools using the metadata which is extremely powerful in being able to identify and answer questions that are relevant to you. In addition, they provide a variety of computational tools on a platform called Galaxy which is available on, on the cloud and uh, scalable based on the size of the compute and the needs of the users. The virus pathogen research, uh, resource, or WIPER as it's called, um, um, is paired with the influenza research database or FluDB. Again, focuses on a variety of, um, of entire family of viral data sets with a focus on immune epitope data, 3D structure data and antiviral drug resistance data as well in, that you can mine and search and query. The Pathogen Resource Integration Center, or PATRIC as it's called short, again provides a variety of collection, data collections across all bacterial species, not just pathogens uh, actually, and um, along with computational tools, and all of these centers provide users what they call a workspace or a workbench to do their own computes and searches and save them. And of course, the bacterial species focuses on a current need on antimicrobial resistance. Primarily, all of these resources are available for the, the complete entire community, and they respond to the needs, whether it's really integrating data sets to, um, to answer specific questions, uh, address new data types as they come into being based on studies as Jessica will talk about uh, clinical and epidemiological data sets captured in a new flavor of eukaryotic pathogen databases called ClinEpidB. Addressing um, viral outbreaks uh, as well as you know antimicrobial resistance that each of these centers have all brought just in time resources to address the needs. What's absolutely critical about these centers is they provide hands-on training and workshops, and not just in the US, but globally, that I would encourage everybody to leverage and make use of. They are extremely useful, hands-on, and give, allow you to bring your own questions and answer them. And this provides um, um, real-time feed, real-life feedback for us in terms of how useful these resources are and what the impact is. Exactly. So, increase, and, and by doing so, we hope to increase the usage and the impact of these resources, which is extremely critical for us to continue to sustain these research, uh, research resources for the community. And this is just a uh, um, um, paper that was published in 2015 that shows how extensively the influenza research uh, database as well as vector base uh, are used and they fall within the top uh, few ranks of these databases. All this, of course, towards enabling uh, the best science, and, and what we hope and strive to do through these centers is leveraging and, uh, these resources uh, to answer specific questions and publish papers, and all of this information is actually openly available on the websites, either the metrics associated, the papers and publications, as well as the citations which reign in the order of hundreds of thousands by now in over the 15 years. And we want to kind of actually further increase that, and that's uh, where these resources are evolving, and as I said, they've started off as genomic databases that provided expert curation and made clean data sets, but it evolved over time from eight centers to four, um, to um, variations in by primarily adding new data types, new tools, and new capabilities associated. And these are up for recompetition this year. And in addition to providing pathogen groups, they have an overarching focus on interoperability between and across these data sets to, to be able to get the most um, value out of these. 
So with that, I want to make a quick segue into uh, what the trends are and what some of the challenges are. And if you look at the NIAID landscape and the programs, the extensive programs across um, our portfolio, we have um, a huge amount of data that is being generated as well as tools being developed. The challenge though is these are somewhat done in silos and sometimes there's a good need to do that but oftentimes there are things that could be reused. And what comes out of these and what's relevant and useful goes into various repositories, knowledge bases or some of the public domain for others to reuse but a good portion of it has no home and gets lost. So how do we change this is what we want to kind of encourage new models for data-driven hypothesis generation. And this is a paper published by our own intramural researcher um, that talks about you know, a, a paradigm shift in how you can use existing data if you can find it, access it, interoperate with it, and reuse it to ask better questions based on which you can generate and establish uh, experiments. And that pivots on the FAIR guidelines, so maybe we should have called this entire track FAIR data management or something like that. Uh, but again, this is extremely critical. And what I wanted to do in the next few minutes kind of uh, demystify what FAIR is um, because you need to translate it into something actionable that each and every one of us can do so that the data becomes findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Because it's easier said than done sometimes. So tactically speaking, all of the projects that NIH funds requires, as Andrea mentioned this morning, uh, data management and sharing plans. So every application that comes in has these plans. Um, and so it's a check mark, we read it, and then and forget about it. So, so I think the idea is to really kind of go back to it and, and really make it actionable. And that's where the FAIR principles come into being. And um, there's a lot of research going on, um, particularly in the, in, in, the, in the EU under the Alexa program that has basically helped demystify what this is and how you can implement it in each of your own projects. And, and we're doing the same as part of NIH's strategy for data science that Andrea spoke about this morning. So I just wanted to spend the next a minute or two on a few examples of what we have done. I don't mean to endorse any of the products or companies over here, but just to kind of demonstrate what people are doing to make data more fair. So the first thing, one of the first things is, is co-location of data and the tools. So if you look on the left side, the, the traditional approach is really where you have data repositories that are built. And it, people are actually copying or downloading these data sets and kind of using it. So they're basically replicating it over and over where the access sometimes is limited, the compute sort of, you know, very kind of limited and fixed, and there are all kinds of other challenges. It worked really well so far, but what's happening, where, because the scale of data is changing, the complexity of data is changing, there's involvement and this has absolutely become critical in terms of all of the research happening in team science, so there's no one person doing it, so many people need to access it at the same time, and you need these harmonized data sets to support better AI and machine learning tools that can be applied on that. So what people have started to do is look to the cloud to see if that can actually solve, if, if not all, at least some of these challenges uh, and enable true data sharing where you're actually bringing the researcher and the tools to the data so the data doesn't move and you're bringing the tools and the researcher to the cloud. The next example that thing that people are doing is anytime you generate a data set, you want to be able to identify it and distinguish it as that particular data set uh, and not variations or flavors of it. So you assign it a digital object identifier or a DOI and that basically helps say this is exactly what I generated and nothing has changed from it. So it's basically a simple way of assigning an ID and so it is what it is. So the other important thing about making data findable and accessible is indexing the data in the resources. Wherever it is, it gets indexed. And so two examples I've thrown out here are related to Google where people have taken very large data sets and it's not even the actual data, but it's the metadata that's being collected can be modeled and the data model exposed in Google's BigQuery that becomes very easily searchable. 
There's no security issues with that, so it becomes, it's very quick and fast. And then you can basically determine what you want and then just go and retrieve that data from the actual uh, physical location of the data or work with it directly on the cloud. The other very new thing that's been launched is the Google Data Search, where basically you, you're scraping off and you're building code into whatever you put over there so you can actually um, um, discover and, and, and access the data and know what's there. Because if you don't know what you don't know, then you can't go looking for it. So Another use that people are doing of is using Jupyter Notebooks, where primarily um, data coming out of related to publications were provided as supplementary materials and they were PDFs, and a PDF is not machine readable. So packaging the tool and um, pointers to the data, regardless of which repository is sitting in a Jupyter notebook, makes it much more accessible and reusable, and also reproducible so that you can exactly reproduce that experiment that somebody else did. Containerization of tools. So what this is, is if you write software to analyze data and run it through pipelines, you can package these in a manner so that it is kind of a, a plug and play like our apps in our iPhones. You can basically take this and plug it into different platforms and run those tools much more easily than having to reconfigure and pretty much rewrite the code in your environment. So that, and this is just an example of how NCBI runs hackathons uh, and this one is related to something called nasty bugs. And so what you can do is you run a hackathon, they develop a pipeline, containerize it, and they simultaneously publish that paper on Faculty 1000. So just kind of showing the ease of how you can do this in a very short time and make it available for anybody else to use it. And there are many tools and products out there that enable you to containerize these tools. Use of application programming interfaces across the board and making it pervasive so that the access is not just through a web interface but is also programmatically made available to others. And, and again, all of these are examples of some NIH funded programs that I'm kind of sharing with you. And so this BioThings APIs is one such thing funded out of the Scripps Research Institute that enables that and encourages people to use application programming interfaces. Use of smart IRBs and methods to appropriately authorize and authenticate um, is, is another key aspect. Um, smart IRBs basically help multi-site um, studies and make it easier and online to basically establish IRBs and kind of provide access to um, the, the rules and regulations associated with it. And authorization and authentication are two big aspects so that we, if we universally use standard methods to authenticate and authorize data sets, it becomes much easier to work and access with them. And then, so basically what I wanna end with is realizing data sharing it, through all these different methods is, is an integral part of what, what is absolutely essential. And this has been the mantra from all the different NIH reports and federal agencies. But what we need to do is find ways to realize them. And I think, I hope I've showed you some examples, how little examples that don't, don't take much effort and don't require a huge um, team, but each of us can do in our own um, projects over there so that you can expand the user base and enable interaction of the users and the contributors directly with each other, as well as realize some of the other outcomes to help democratize these resources truly and accelerate research. And I think um, th I just want to end with the fact that I always do this with funding opportunities that are available for people. And these are two things that are you uh, focus on um, some of the NIAID resources. One is basically secondary analysis of existing data sets from the bioinformatic resources that you can use. And this is what is called an R21 mechanism that you can kind of bring your own data leverage data that's already available over there, combine them, do some analysis, and then make the outputs fair as well. The other one is developing tools associated with data available in another um, repository called import, and this is not yet out, but the, this, the, um, the, the project has been approved for, for release, so you should see that shortly. And with that, I just want to say thanks and, uh, again for the opportunity to share um, um, about our program and resources that we have. Okay, great. Thank you all. I um, appreciate it. I'm going to try and tie together two previous talks. The first one that we heard from Dr. Moses Kamya, 
um, regarding introducing the PRISM study, which will be the second half of my talk. The first half will follow up on Ishvar's talk where he introduced the bioinformatics resource centers. And you'll see how they're both related in, in just a moment. So this is UPAF-DB. I'm not going to go into gory molecular details. This is a data meeting, <laughs> right? But I want to talk about the fact that you know, as we all know, there is more and more data. We have 337 organisms in just this one bioinformatics resource center. And importantly, for a very, a large number of pathogens of great significance, this is the malaria pathogen right here. Um, and we have abilities to go in and mine those data from a number of different methods. So if you were to expand this as I just did here, you can go and find genes by text, by their ID, by their genomic location. Matter of fact, you can go in and search it by dozens of ways. You might want to know where it's located on the chromosome. Does it have a signal peptide? Does it have a particular protein motif? Is, it, is this protein located in a place in the cell? So many, many different access points. And so we did this because we are serving a community and the community needed ways to understand the data that made sense to them that we're serving. And, and so we've had to tackle data that were very important to researchers that covered many, many different omic or clinical types of data. And we had to find the ways to accept each of these data types, to process them uniformly in the database and present them. And so we have over 580, whoops, unique data sets in the database. That's not counting the genome. So each of these are sets. And We've had to create more than, or import, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel, 2,268 distinct metadata terms to date to be able to describe and make these data interoperable <laughs> with other resources by using standard ontologies. The majority of which you will see are related to clinical data. The omics data were far simpler. And so I'm not gonna walk you through the database, but I want to take you to one aspect of visualization that proved transformatory, for, tra transformational, I should say, for our, our audience in terms of mining data. If we were to use the word a Boolean operation, they would freak out and run out the door, okay? But everyone understands a Venn diagram. This right here is a search to look for a vaccine candidate. Starting with my particular organism of interest, find proteins that are secreted, that might be stuck on the membrane because they have a transmembrane domain, that are expressed in the right stage of the parasite, that we have mass spec evidence that the protein is, is produced, that is under diversifying selection according to population data. And then because this might only exist in one parasite, but we really want to look at it in another one, we're going to exploit evolutionary relationships. And this is part of that hypothesis generation that has been generated earlier, and that is using data which came from at least a dozen different studies that were imported and integrated, you can narrow down a list of potential vaccine candidates to 83 based on these data, all right? And that's something you can actually go in now as a biologist and look at and begin to think about further. So it's a very good hypothesis generating uh, approach. And as users use the database, we draw this dynamically for them so they can see, and they have choices of how to relate the data. They can intersect them, subtract them, union them, and even co-correlate them relative to each other someplace on the genome. You might want SNPs that fall in promoters as opposed to coding regions, for example. All right, I mentioned we have to leverage um, syntony and evolutionary relationships because there are so many genome sequences, many of them are not adequately annotated or curated, and you need the ability to understand if how your genome sequence, each one of these lines is a different genome sequence, compares to others that are related to test a hypothesis that you may have. All right, so we have an oversight committee. We respond to our community, and where I think we've been very successful, I just wanna point out, we have more than 1,000 submitters who have provided more than 12,000 comments on t nearly 24,000 genes in the database. It's very active, and as was mentioned earlier, Researchers have their own data. They want to look at their data in the context of other data. And so we've created this Galaxy platform. It's free. All of this is open to the public, where we provide the reference genomes as the back end, and users can come with their own RNA-seq data or new genome sequences from a field isolate, and they want to see how it compares or differs to what's already in the database. They can upload it. The pipelines are already created, and then they can bring the answer back into the database and look at it in the context of the data without actually sharing the data with us. They're not you're not depositing it. You have the ability to then analyze it 
secretly until you're ready to publish it. All right, so we were able to leverage that back end, which had the power to take different data sets, integrate them, and let you slice and dice them any way you want it to, to then respond to the emerging challenge of dealing with very large clinical epidemiology data sets. And I'm going to highlight the PRISM study that was mentioned earlier that has so many different data points. Now this uh, slide is really um, busy, so I'm going to zoom in. Um, and so each study is represented by a card, and the kinds of things that you can do in that study, searching participants or clinical information or their housing or vectors, different studies have different types of data available, but it lets you immediately just click on it and go to utilize the data more fully. If we clicked on the PRISM card, we would be taken to, to a page that, in great detail, that I understand you cannot read, right, explains the methodology behind these details, because studies are complicated, just as, as molecular studies, and you need to understand what was the experimental design in order to be able to effectively utilize the data. All right, so I've, I've tried to make this a little bit bigger. We have a similar study. You don't see the Venn diagrams, but we're going to take this approach of where we kind of walk across a data set. So you can see we're looking at clinical data. So these are clinical observations for the PRISM study. First geographic region. As we know, it had three different sites, all right, for a total of 48,721 observations for the PRISM 1 study, distributed between these three different locations. And we can select Nagongera if we want. When we do that, that reduces the number of, of potential records down to 23,000. I then might want to go in and select by age, and I could fill out the little boxes with the age, or I could just take my mouse, because we'll draw the histogram for you, and say, oh, I only want the young children, or I want older individuals. So you can very quickly and visually, and the nice thing is the difference in color here between pink and gray is the difference from that first selection. All the data in the database are shown in gray, but because we reduced ourselves to Nagongera, we are looking at only a subset of the data shown in pink. So you automatically know what kind of selection, the impact that you're having. All right. Um, you can then, if you wanted to, go and filter further. You can drill down through the data for any number of reasons. Here I've just picked a hemoglobin phenotype. Um, you can go and drill down into the type of house that someone looked at. And this turns out to actually um, be interesting. Um, do they have a modern house or do they live in a traditional type of house? I didn't select any of those, so our record number has stayed the same. Okay? And then I can even go in and look at individual observations from particular visits. For example, he, uh, Dr. Kaima spoke a lot about asymptomatic patients, right? And so we. If, what if, if your blood smear um, negative, but your lamp positive, or your blood smear positive, but you don't show any signs of malaria? These are characteristic of being asymptomatic. And so, to really make sure you have asymptomatic patients, you could go in and now look at temperature, and you can, we can take all of those that are only in the, have a normal temperature and not elevated 38 degrees or higher, all right, to have a truly asymptomatic population. And that narrows down the number of records that we can look at, and I can add to it jaundice or muscle fatigue or any other number of clinical symptoms collected that day. All right, and so finally, I can, if any of these cases still came through and seem to be symptomatic, I can select them, and I can also then remove the symptomatic patients. And the reason I'm going to do this is I just wanted to show you, you'll recognize our little strategy system up here again. So we went through that long filtering process to come up with asymptomatic patients. And now it's telling us data by this anonymous record locator here for each participant. And I want to go back and I'm going to add information on housing. So I can go to add a column over here. I'm going to add information on what kind of housing they live in. We'll get the floor material, the roof material, the wall material. And I can, I can see these now and I can select on them. And you can just make a histogram based on age and material. We have a number of tools. And you'll notice that the appearance of asymptomatic increases with age. This was something that was just immediately could be um, pulled from the data very easily um, uh, with, without having to go into very heavy statistics, which of course are needed for the true epidemiological study. But if you're trying to get that first look, this is very helpful. All right, finally, um, for an individual patient that you might look at in these studies, sorry, 
This is a view that was actually generated by an epidemiologist involved in the project, Brian Greenhouse. And he came to us and he said, look, he said, I need to visually be able to see a patient's treatment all the way through the project. You know, what has happened to them? When were they sick? When they're not sick? When did we see them? And he drew something that looked like this on the board. <laughs> and we copied it, all right, exactly. And so for each patient, you're looking at six years across here. We're going from 2011 to two, the middle of 2016. And everywhere there is a circle, there was a, a, a patient visit in the study. And depending on the color of the circle or the shade of the outline, that indicates different outcomes. Usually when it's red, they were malaria positive, high parasitemia, <laughs> all right? Or you may have had uh, other indicators that you were positive by PCR, but you were asymptomatic. And this is that visual representation that our brain can process oh so quickly in terms of understanding the data. All right. so. We could run a complex study looking for asymptomatics and um, asking about, we want to make sure that they've been seen at least three times in a row, they're asymptomatic, and you look at the type of housing, traditional houses or not, and there was an interesting correlation that popped up in the data. So for asymptomatics that live in modern homes, when you're looking at the distribution of cases by age, you see this particular pattern. When you look in traditional homes, you see a different pattern. All right, and again, these were all interpretations where you can go in and mine the data. Okay, so to bring it to an end, I, we've seen a tremendous evolu community evolution while we've been doing this, as, as uh, Ishvar indicated. Um, we've been doing this as a bioinformatics resource center since 2004. The malaria database, PlasmoDB, actually started back in 2000. Um, and we've all evolved from just wanting to browse and look at data to maybe ask a few questions to now want to integrate and take this data and bring it together with that data, to now asking the data to actually facilitate taking your science to the next level, where you're able to generate hypotheses from existing data and take them further. Now, I know I went through the, the ClinEpi data slides very fast, so uh, I just want to let you know that there are some cards on the front page underneath the study sections where some of these uh, queries are already run, and you can just click on a card and go in and look at some of these interesting questions that are presented. So I want to finish up by saying that our user base is primarily located in endemic countries. Um, there is certainly a lot of usage, I'm sorry, from, from the United States and from Europe. But for example, amoeba DB is most highly accessed by Mexico. Um, you'll see the trypanosomes being very highly accessed by South America um, and, and Brazil in particular. And so you'll notice that that's important. It means you're reaching the right community that you're trying to. I'll also tell you that our databases, while we didn't make it onto the picture that Ishvar showed, it's because our databases have 12 different names. <laughs> so we're actually some of the most utilized resources you may never have heard of. Um, if you look at Google Scholar citations, which I think are important to look at because databases are taken for granted and are not often cited officially in papers, but people will mention them in the methods. So we have over 18,000 citations for our various different component databases. This is PlasmoDB here on the bottom. And we're, we're now ravaging over 80,000 uh, unique logins per month. And this is after removing robots and various other sorts of self-hits. Um, and actually, our definition of a user is someone who returns at least three times a month and stays for at least 30 minutes. And we have over 50,000 of these per month um, on the databases. All right, so it takes a team to make a resource this large. Um, so uh, this, this is a, the team, this was our last retreat. Um, we get together in person every 18 months. We're split up across three continents. Um, this project, as was mentioned, UPATHDB, um, is funded primarily by the National Institutes of Health with some supplemental funding from the Wellcome Trust for particular aspects of the database. The Clina Epi infrastructure that I showed you. And again, I want to emphasize it is the exact same back end that is running these databases. But we developed a different front end for a different audience. Whoops. Um, and that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And not only do we have the PRISM data, we have all of the GEMS and Teric Pathogens data. We're taking the PROMOTE data that Dr. Carmia mentioned. And so uh, you'll see many more data sets coming. And, uh, there are three of us uh, that are involved in running these projects, so David Roos at, Rupen, at UPenn and my other collaborator, Christiana Hertzfowler in Liverpool. And our goal, as always, is to help the end users to do better research and better science and, of course, to make the data fair. Thank you. <laughs>